on this episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab. Uh, hey, T Ballers, here's the problem we can help you solve today. Lean in and listen up because our board certified wellness practitioner from across the pond is here to alert you that there's a substance in your home that's endangering the health of your family and it's as addictive as cocaine. Uh, our guest today, Lynn, says that life is not over just because you've reached midlife. Uh, Lynn believes it can be fun, joyful, and even fulfilling. Coming up next on um, Therapy by Chart Lab. Be tuned following the interview for On the Couch and Off the Rocker, our special guest's psychosilly analysis by Art Lab's own head cabager, Dr. Ima Freudnot. Welcome to Therapy Bites Art Lab, where Dr. Heath and his special guests share real life stories of helping and healing. Fresh from the actual therapy couch, while taking a bite out of common counseling missteps and misconceptions. And now, here's Heath. And the T-Ball team. Lynn Wadsworth is the owner and founder of Holistic Health and Wellness LLC and curator of the Energized Healthy Women's Club. She is a AADP certified holistic health practitioner who earned her certification through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in New York. And she's also a certified wellness cooking instructor. Lynn's area of expertise involves working with women who are in midlife, who are tired of the changes they see and experience on a daily basis. She helps them achieve a higher level of health, allowing them to experience more energy, less belly bloat. Gosh, would that be a nice thing for all of us? Fear, mood swings, headaches, cravings and weight loss. She believes that living in health and wellness takes in many areas of her lives, not just with diet and healthy eating, and she helps her clients make these changes permanent. Stay in the stands at the end of the interview, T-Ballers, and witness our special guest slug a bite-sized brain ball with your name all over it, clean out of the art lab. Lynn, welcome today, and uh, tell us a little bit about your story and what you do. How did you get into the whole battling of uh, uh, sugar and sweets and addiction and those drug-like sugar dealers out there that that seem to be putting their products on every supermarket line? (laughs) Well, I'm from England. What can I say? We have the best chocolate in the world, in my opinion. And so I started right from when I was little. Fridays were our super duper treat day when my dad came home from work and gave us what we called pocket money. And we'd head over to the grocery store across the street. Actually, it was what we called a news agent. And we'd buy our sweets. And they were supposed to be for the week, but of course, they were gone within minutes. (laughs) And really, totally being ignorant of what sugar could could do to my body. So I was a yo-yo dieter. So up and down, up and down. And I actually thought I was a big boned person. Um, I'm five foot two and very small boned. So I've gone from being as high as 170 to being as low as being anorexic actually at 96 pounds. Oh my word. Um, all because I left leg weighs 96 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, though, I'd still look in the mirror at 96 pounds and feel like I was fat. I felt like a fat person was looking back at me and um, my family just kept telling me I looked like a ghost and I looked awful and I'd better do something. But so I never learned how to eat right. I, I I didn't learn that there are different nutrients you can put in your body that really help and help you be energized and help you feel good. Instead, you know, I carry on eating the sugar and eating the processed foods. And by the time I was in midlife, I was a full blown sugar addict. I would go home to England and I would pack my suitcase with all things Cadbury because actually Cadbury over there is definitely different to Cadbury over here. And I would bring it home and I would hide it in the freezer. And if my kids got their hands on it, then, (laughs) oh, woe was them. (laughs) And that's a true sugar addict. It's like being an alcoholic where you hide your alcohol. So it's all over the place, but nobody knows where it is. And I was like that with sugar. 
Oh my! So, th- there's a book called "Someone uh, Who Moved My Cheese." I guess yours would be "Who Moved My Chocolate." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is that is so incredible. And and you know, I hadn't thought about this before uh, our interview today. But as you're talking, just dawned on me. As you said, the uh, talking about putting nutrients in your body and and paying attention to what you you know. Um, I, I guess most people really don't pay attention to what they eat. They're, they're really uh, my my uncle Bryson and uh, Uncle Bryson, man, I miss our camping trips. But we we would go on these camping trips, and I remember as a kid uh, camping out in the middle of the woods, uh, we would cook whatever, and then Uncle Bryson described himself as the garbage disposal, and he would eat whatever was left over, and I thought, what a cool thing, until I became the garbage disposal. I, I would, I, it was almost a personal mission to not have leftover food. And I would just eat whatever was left over because my cognitive distortion, uh, my automatic negative thought, ant, negative automatic thought, nah, they're the same thing. But uh, my cognitive distortion was if, if you're throwing food away, you're wasting it and, you know, waste not, want not, and I would eat it until I discovered that, you know, if I eat it, the food is gone. If I throw it in the garbage, same result, the food is also gone. But I came to the conclusion that I could actually be healthier if I just put the food in the garbage instead of in my mouth. Treat the garbage can like a garbage can, not your body. And a lot of people treat their uh, body like a garbage can. They, they, they'll they make sure to always put the proper fuel in their tank. You you don't put diesel in a gas burner. You don't put unleaded in a diesel. I have a diesel just right outside this building and uh, because it messes it up. But but it's alarming to me that people pay no attention to what they put in their body. If you put if you took my truck to the local gas station, which is really, I guess, a misnomer because they sell diesel there, too, to the local fuel station and you put uh, unleaded gas in it, it will screw up the engine, uh, which is why you wouldn't do that. But uh, uh, I guess people just don't realize that putting all this sugar in their bodies and other just junk food, I've told many people when I see them eating things, gosh, your body would be better off if you threw that stuff away you're calling food and just ate the package it came in. At least it'd be more fiber or roughage. But uh, uh, what what kind of distorted thinking do you find people have where they just keep cramming their mouths full of stuff that's really quite deadly for them? Well, of course, the whole thing is people haven't yet had that awakening. So it tends to be an automatic thing like you're talking about being a garbage disposal. Um, it just tends to be that they eat what they want when they want. And they haven't really thought about what is this doing to my body? It's really lack of knowledge. So until you actually have that knowledge and you have the enlightenment, um, most people carry on doing that. So when people come to me and I begin discussing the whole thing, because it's not just sugar that comes in chocolate. Sugar is everywhere. We know that you can go into the grocery store and something will say, healthy. And as people try to eat healthier, they'll look at those boxes and see, oh, this is healthier for me, so I'm going to buy it. But if you actually learn to read the labels and you see what the content of especially sugar, since we're talking about it, is, then you begin, you know, light goes off in your head. I mean, for example, a grand caramel brulee latte where we all love to go and get these things, 52 grams of sugar. And Mm. that's not even talking about what the, what the, um, the calorie content is because I try to, to teach my clients not necessarily to count calories. Um, But, you know, if you're looking at something like that, it actually does have 480 calories. The Frappuccino version, 63 grams of sugar and 410 calories. I mean, that that's a huge amount of caloric intake that you're putting into your body for absolutely zero nutrition whatsoever. 
Yeah, guys, so, and, and I want to yeah. put a put put a different way of thinking about that. What Lynn just said is, if you're eating something that has say sixty grams of sugar, uh, uh, imagine standing in front of your sugar container, and we have one on our countertop. Uh, it actually has something else in it, not sugar. But that's like uh, sitting there and spooning fifteen teaspoons of sugar into your mouth. If you're getting one of these at your local. Uh, uh, Caffeine Cafe. Uh, I have my own Caffeine Cafe. I'm a trained barista, by the way. <clears throat> and uh, that's why I love coffee and, and espresso so much. Or maybe I'm a barista because I love coffee and espresso. I just don't put a lot, I just don't put sugar in it. But if you're taking in 60 grams of sugar, I think the calculation is about 15 teaspoons of sugar. Just try that sometime. You're eating it anyway. Uh, stand there in front of your sugar pot. And instead of drinking that, loaded caffeine drink, try spooning 15 teaspoons of sugar in your mouth to say you like that. It might break you the sugar habit. Uh, my granddad used that on my Uncle Howard. He caught him smoking cigarettes, and he made him stand in front of the toilet because he knew what would happen, and he had him smoke uh, two packs of cigarettes. He never smoked again. I don't know. Maybe these days we'd call that child abuse, but it worked for my Uncle Howard. <laughs> and uh, try that with your uh, with your sugar. Uh, to, you know, we, we need to find ways to shock people out of their unconscious use of these substances mm -hmm. or nothing ever changes. Uh, and what what would you say was the big thing that shocked you awake? So I, I learned um, that sugar uses the same kind of brain cells and chemicals as caf as cocaine so when i learned that i was basically putting a, a something like cocaine into my body but it tasted different and looked different it was eye opening to me because i had never ever thought about it like that before um i mean i'd learned a lot about sugar as I was getting to that point of going to school and, and learning new things. But that's pretty scary when you think it has the same effect on your body as, as cocaine, because who's going to go down to the corner store and buy a few bags of cocaine? Well, we know drug addicts are, but normally in your day, you're not going to the corner and getting that cocaine fix. But what we're doing is we're getting our sugar fix and it's acting the same way in our body. Uh, and what happens is, yep, sugar occurs naturally in nearly all of our foods, but that's the natural state. We're talking about something that's not the natural way to eat it. And it, it's, um, it, it contains, when it's natural, lots of vitamins and minerals, but refined sugar, which is how we get it, it actually depletes the body of minerals and enzymes. It can cause an acidic environment, so that causes digestive issues, sinus congestion, cellulite, ladies, mm -hmm. headaches, um, allergies, and it has a negative impact on our blood sugar. So little, oh, can actually make you irritable. Um, anxious, and because we talked about anti-aging, it can cause wrinkles, poor sleep, hormonal imbalances. And so when I learned all about this, it was like a wake-up call to me. Why am I doing this to my body? I may love that substance. And I'm not saying don't ever eat chocolate again, don't eat what you love, because I go Oh, on thank like, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> If you live a healthy lifestyle, like an 80%, 20%, your 20% is all those great things that you love and you can treat yourself to. But I've learned workarounds to help my sweet tooth. And I, I can honestly say it's been quite a long time since I've had chocolate. Um, I had one piece, I think, at Christmas when my husband blatantly put it on the coffee table <laughs> and I thought well I just have to try this and you know I didn't even enjoy it um but it it really knowledge is power for people think about it like this because it causes inflammation in the body think how many people suffer with arthritis Im immune problems um they're bloated all the time. 
they have look at the diabetes these days and, and of course not to mention the obesity but in with that inflammation that you're getting from the sugar it suppresses your immunity it can also increase the risk of cancer lead to gastrointestinal problems cause reactive hypoglycemia it it also interferes with your absorption of protein, can cause food allergies. Of course, we know it hampers weight loss. It can actually increase cholesterol and it accelerates the aging process, can increase anxiety, make you moody, and it can complicate things like ADD, ADHD and other spectrum related issues. By the way, on the uh, just a quick point there, Lynn, on the uh, interaction between sugar and cholesterol, so our, our listeners and viewers on YouTube understand this. The uh, uh, and and I get this from a, a cardio. I'm not a cardiologist. I get this from a cardiologist colleague that explained it to me. Is uh, a simple way to understand that is eating sugar is going to raise triglycerides, and triglycerides are going to make your uh, blood cells more sticky and put you at greater risk for a cardiac condition. So imagine making the stuff that goes through the veins in your body more sticky, and then you're going to get the narrowing of the arteries, and then you're going to predispose yourself to heart attack. And guess what else? Uh, those blood cells also run through your brain, and you can put yourself at greater risk of a stroke. Uh, I don't recall who said this, uh, but 90-plus percent of all physical maladies are driven by lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, what you're doing to your body today, you you probably aren't going to notice the effects of it tomorrow or the next day or next week or next month, but you're designing your life today how it's going to be a decade from now, how your body functions a decade from now and I don't mean to be critical or judgy, and it's good that uh, Lynn uh, is such an expert in coaching because she can teach folks how to do this. And, and she, it's not a judging thing. It's an information thing. You can do anything you want with this information. But 10 years from now, you can look in the mirror at your body and you can say, I chose this. Your body weight, you can say, I chose this. Your level of ability or disability, your aches and pains in your joints outside of some catastrophic physiological condition, we choose our level of ability or disability in the future and the things that you're learning on this episode today that Lynn is taking her time to share with you is power. And I hope that you guys are writing this down, listening to it, ready to make some changes. And I can so attest to that because by the time I had this aha moment in my life, actually my triglycerides were 500 and I, I believe they're supposed to be about 100. And I am predisposed for what you're talking about with the clogging of the arteries. That was what my dad had. Um, I had high cholesterol, high blood pressure. I had a lot of fat around my stomach and, you know, it's especially important in midlife to do what you can to get rid of that, what we call visceral fat, because that's what causes the problems for us. So you're absolutely right, because when I change my lifestyle, um, my triglycerides and cholesterol dropped to normal. I got off the blood pressure medication. Um, my migraines went from being daily to, thanks to our Florida weather, that would hamper my desire for none of them but i've never been able to get rid of them completely living here in a barometric pressured cook pot so to speak <laughs> yeah. for the cook yes. <laughs> well i can tell you're very passionate about this lynn and um there's you know quite a few people who are in this line of work but with you what what's kind of a um your unique approach to working with clients in this field yeah, number one is I, I always want people to come in and know that they're in a, a zone of total non-judgment. I've been there, I've done that. People can, for some people, they can come in, they can learn and right away do it. But I like to hold them accountable. And I think 
why I'm different is I do it in simple steps. So it can be very overwhelming for people. You come in, you're told, hey, you're eating too much processed sugar. It's causing a lot of your problems. Let's get rid of it. Well, it's not always that simple. For me, it had to be because my migraines were so debilitating, I couldn't even function. But for most people, they can be compassionate with themselves and they can do it step by step. So I try to teach them the pillars of hell step by step. Let's work on one thing at a time. Um, let me give you resources to help you understand the sugar. And then let's work at removing it from your life. It may be in, in baby steps for some people. For some people, they may go from A to Z really quickly. Um, but I am the type of person that sticks with people to the end. I'm going to see them through to the result that they want and, and not give up on them. And during all this time, keep affirming them and encouraging them because I never had anyone to do that for me during my um, time of trying to get healthy again. And I want to encourage people, men and women, that if you think about midlife these days, it's age 50 or 60. 60, or, there you go. 60. I'll vote for 50. <laughs> but when, when people get, and I say 50 because most women are starting to go through menopause then. So years ago, that was why talk about it? Why do much about it? We've only got 20 more years to live. Well, now when you get to midlife, you've got 40, 50 more years. You're halfway through your life. Do you want to live your life healthy, full of vitality, not looking your age, um, always having the energy to do what you want, not having those aches and pains? You can get out and walk. You can get out and be active. And you know, that's why I'm passionate about it, because I've been there where I fall asleep at the desk, where I couldn't get out and move because I hurt everywhere because of the inflammation. And we don't have to live that way. We can live above that. We don't have to look like we're 80. And, and, and I say that because my mother-in-law, bless her heart, was out in the Florida sun for all these years. And at age 50, she looked like she was 80. She actually had a facelift. It was that bad. And after that, she began to treat her body a bit better. But we can live a long, happy life filled with joy and contentment. And who doesn't want that? So I am really passionate about getting people from A to Z without judgment and in a manner that that they can handle. Well, and, and I hear people talk like, like you just mentioned, you know, what's the use? I'm, I'm at this age, middle age, my life is over. But uh, that's treating your life uh, and your body like an automobile. Some people look at their automobile and think, gosh, well, why do I want to clean it or, or, or maintain it because I'm going to trade it in next year? Well, guys, your body, you can't trade it in. It's the only one you got. And I've seen folks that are in their 70s, I kid you not, that will start bodybuilding. Imagine that. In their 70s, that will start bodybuilding. You have no idea the the rejuvenation that your body is capable of if you'll just provide it the tools necessary for that rejuvenation. I've seen people in their 70s uh, start PhD programs. Uh, I've seen people in their 80s start uh, a bachelor's degree program. It is it is never too late to start doing something healthy. Uh, life is not over until it's really over. You're you're just wasting uh, the resource of life. The the most precious thing on the planet is life, and I think living to the fullest, you have to provide your body the tools. And Lynn, I'm glad that you're here sharing those sharing those tools with us. And and on the the uh, the judging thing, a a quick question. Uh, and I, I know Heather had a question, but what? Uh, if you have a loved one who is struggling with, I don't know, just healthy living, healthy eating, uh, I find folks tell me it's, it's, they care so much about this person and they're so frustrated and they don't know what to do. And then they start catastrophizing. And then 
their call it family coaching, personal coaching recommendations come across as frustration, irritation, anger, but it comes from a good place. They really care. I mean, for me as a human, um, here's how to know I don't care for you. If I don't care for you, I get more and more quiet. The less I care about you, the less I will speak. The more I care about you, the more I will share information with you. But what tip would you have about folks sharing information in a way that can be received in a healthier manner? Well, of course, you hit the nail on the head. It's all about judgment. And many times our family members feel judged. So I, what I have learned with my family, because I have um, a family member who was very overweight with diabetes, and I would just say, why don't you come work? Let me work with you because I can teach you a healthy way. They don't want to hear from family members very often. So it's really you don't sit there and say, well, if you don't change your life and you continue to do this, this, this and this, this is what's going to happen to you. You need to find some ways where you can um encourage them without it looking like you're trying to meddle. So, you know, here's an example. Um, would you like to go, there's, there's a new, um, actually, there's a new vegan restaurant in our area. Alleluia, we've never had one. Um, what Would you mind coming with me and trying it and see what you think and take them out for a healthy meal or... Um, do you want to go out for a walk with me? I, I'm so tired of not having anybody to walk with. Would you go with me? You know, maybe just take 30 minutes and encourage them to do some of the healthy lifestyle things. Um, start maybe bringing them a healthy dinner and say, I just made this for myself and I, I love it. I brought you a plate. Let me know what you think. Just find some creative ways to do it because it's very hard with, with family and loved ones for it not to come across as if you're judging them. And very often a third party can say the same thing to them and say it very bluntly and they will listen. So maybe you've got a, a friend or somebody in your sphere that these people know that could really address this in a loving way and, and whenever you talk to them really do it from a place of love and let that love come across so that um, they know you're there to help very very difficult when you're dealing with family members and you yeah you just have to get creative in the way that you do it and I think, too, uh, for the person wanting to share their information to decatastrophize, life is long. This isn't the only conversation that you'll ever have. Uh, if you catastrophize it, then you're going to, based on that thought process, it is our thoughts which create our emotions. If you don't want to be angry in a situation, then decide a different way of thinking. This is not a catastrophe person's not going to drop dead of the hamburger in their hand right now. Uh, I love them. But uh, change your thinking and you'll change your emotions. And to decatastrophize, I think, is one of the best ways to start out that conversation. By the way, uh, you listeners to in the art lab, you know that, uh, as I just said, uh, it is our thought processes that create our emotions. And if you're a person that thinks you're being judged Here's a cognitive restructuring of that. Guess what? Being judged is not a feeling. There is no feeling that you can have that is evidence you're being judged. Emotions. Happy, sad, mad, glad, disgusted, ashamed, stressed, pressed, anxious, angry. Emotions, feelings, same thing. Uh, none of those are evidence that you're being judged. You can be angry. It doesn't mean someone's judging you. You can be sad or irritated. Pick, pick your emotion. That doesn't mean you're being judged. Uh, uh, being judged is a belief. If you tell yourself this person is judging me, which what does that really mean? What that really means is I think they're telling me that I'm less than, that I'm broken, that I'm screwed up that I don't measure up, that I don't amount to much, that I'm a lost cause. But guys, listen, that's all coming from inside of your brain. That's not what that person's doing. I mean, unless they're really saying it, and they're probably not saying it. 
They may say put down the cheeseburger, but that doesn't mean that they think you're less or broken or screwed up. Uh, that's all coming from inside the vault of your skull. The next time you have the cognition, I quote, feel like I'm being judged, realize, number one, that's not a feeling. There's no feeling that lets you know that someone's judging you. That's a thought process. Ask yourself, what am I telling myself about what this person is saying? What am I telling myself? Imagine that uh, this loved one is telling you, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but you're about to step off a cliff. That's information. How would you like for them to relay that to you? Would you like for them to keep their mouth shut and let you step off the cliff? Would you like for them to say, hey, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt or intrude. You may not know this. You're about to, well, you've already stepped off the freaking cliff by that point. The best way to view this is this person evidently is talking to me at, because they care about me. It, it's not judging. This is their way of expressing concern for me. But my point being, folks, is I, I found one of the major things in getting in a healthy lifestyle is those that surround you, we for some reason think that they're evil. Uh, someone telling me to eat one less cheeseburger, they're just evil. They're <laughs> telling me to, to lose weight. Oh, well, you can restructure that distorted cognition that they, they're not being evil. They're, they're trying to say, hey, you may disagree, but I'm trying to share with you. It looks like nutritionally you're stepping off a cliff. Now, for you sharing this information, here's a quick tip for you is look for a window of opportunity but realize that conversation doesn't have to happen right then. There are things that I think about sharing with my loved ones, and I've thought about it for days, weeks, and sometimes months, literally. I've thought about it for a month before I ever say these things. But look for a window of opportunity and, and pick the right one. And when you do that, uh, engage in some genuineness. And what does that mean? That means... Really dig down deep and ask yourself, why am I sharing this information with this person? Why am I sharing this information with this person? You may think, uh, and you may not even know you're thinking this, you may be visualizing them in their casket. See, that's where this is coming from often, is we don't know we're thinking about it, but we're really imagining their lifestyle leading them to no longer be in our life. Or we may be envisioning them suffering a disability because of this lifestyle. See, if you're going to share this information, get your mind set into that, so then they can really better perceive uh, and hear your intent. And you can share that with them. You know, you are so special to me, I can't imagine not having you in my life. Now, isn't that a lot different than pointing fingers and yelling? For full show notes and transcript of today's episode, go to therapybites.podbean.com. Welcome to Social Media Smackdown. Tonight, the irresistible force meets the illogical object. Ladies and gentlemen... Let's get ready to reason! Hey, T-Balders, Doc Heath here, and we're here on Social Media Smackdown to give a shout-out to a fellow warrior on Social Media Smackdown, Bull 19, Bull 91, Bull 21, who responded to a comment with this. People don't want to take responsibility for their well-being. It's easier to say, I was gaslighted, hence I'm a victim. Victims will be gaslighted because they are prone to be victims. Once they change their pattern of thinking and communicating, there will be no one to gaslight, but it's easier to blame the other. You know Bull 19, Bull 91, Bull 21? I couldn't have said it better myself. Here's a shout-out from Doc Keith on taking down some pseudo-psychological social media Kool-Aid and Ricky nonsense. Catch you next time, guys. Doc Keith out. What a slobber knocker. The winner by Psychological Smackdown, Doc Heath! 
no pronouns were harmed during the production of this podcast. You're listening to Therapy Bites Art Lab. Bite-sized therapy for your brain with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball Team. The best advice on the net. No copay required. Welcome to the Therapy Bites Art Lab Library, where we have poured over thousands of volumes to bring you the latest Couch Crumbs quote. Oh, would you like a napkin? You're getting crumbs in the book. That okay, me eat book. Oh. Oh, mom, 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 mom. And now today's Couch Crumbs quote. Good evening. Thank you for joining me, Psylocke Holmes, for another bit of wisdom from Doc Heath's Couch Crumb Quotes. When researching studies, be careful to remember that no matter how credentialed or intelligent, and those are two very different things, The conclusions must never exceed the variables the researcher failed to consider. It's elementary. Oh, you got crumbs on the couch. Extra points for you. Live the art life. Become a T-Ball teammate inner circle supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash therapy bites. Here's Heath. And the T-Ball team. What were some of the most difficult things that you had to overcome through your journey? Getting out of this diet mentality because I dieted all of my life. I started when I was probably about 16. And I didn't realize, obviously, the effect it was having on my body. But when I got to the point at an early age of having had quite a few surgeries, having these daily migraines, um being overweight, trying to get from being a person who had never paid attention to what she ate and just eating whatever I wanted unless I was on a diet. And then I restricted myself so much that, you know, I would lose the weight, but then I'd go right back to the way I was. So I had to, the biggest thing for me was getting out of that diet mentality and getting over to this is a lifestyle. If I want to live a good, healthy life, I'm going to have to make some changes. Um, And I think coming to that realization was the hardest obstacle because that meant for me having to give up foods I'd eaten for, for years. For example, my English chocolate, which I absolutely love, And then when I learned more about getting rid of the diet mentality, I began to realize living a healthy lifestyle was not about deprivation. So there was a lot of things in my mind because I think the mindset, and this is where it all starts for me, whatever you're thinking in the mind changes how you react to things. Mm -hmm. Um, So really getting my mindset where it needed to be so that I could live a healthy lifestyle and not live in either dissatisfaction with myself, um, eating too much stuff. The mindset is just, as Dr. Heath would say, I mean, it's just the crux of the matter, really. When we get our mindset straight, we can get our life straight. What well, as we like to say in the art lab, we first engineer our thoughts, then our thoughts engineer our lives. I was having a discussion the other day, as I do, gosh, most days, uh, with um, with a client and, and motivation, inevitably motivation comes up. And people tend to view motivation as some type of secret elixir uh, that you can go buy next to the, the Cairo syrup at Walmart or something. <laughs> and and, and it, I think I, I, I've mentioned Jocko Willink. I, I love what Jocko Willink does. He does a lot of great work on, on discipline. Um, but the part he leaves out is I, I don't think that Jocko, and if you're listening, man, no harm. I love your stuff. But he doesn't understand, like most don't, about motivation. Uh, motivation is built on the back of our thought processes. And I was talking with a guy the other day that was he was all talking about uh, motivation, but he was just talking about the positive stuff, motivated to go to the gym, uh, motivated to eat a a, a wheat biscuit instead of a candy bar, whatever, uh, which who would be motivated to wheat, wheat biscuit when you have a candy bar? 
But I pointed out to him that everybody has motivation. Everybody. No one ever lacks motivation because every behavior must have motivation to occur. There is no behavior without motivation. And that includes if you're getting up and doing like I do three days a week and running three miles, or if you're sitting your butt on a couch eating potato chips. M both of those are the result of motivation. One is in a healthy direction. One is in an unhealthy direction. Your thought processes drive which direction you're going to go, which direction that motivation takes you. If you're motivated to, if you sit on the couch, well, that's that's motivation. If you're motivated uh, to to eat uh, Hershey's Kisses all day long, well, that that's motivation based on a thought process. And who doesn't love Hershey's Kisses, especially the dark chocolate ones? Um, <laughs> but uh, discipline is built on the back of motivation. Okay, let's reverse engineer. Discipline is built on the back of motivation. Motivation is built on the back of thought processes. If you want your motivation to be in the proper direction, then that has to be based on healthy thought processes, meaning I think about things in a way that that is, is meaningful and provides value to my life. Do I want to run three miles tomorrow morning? Absolutely freaking not. It doesn't matter, though. My motivation for doing that is I don't want to be in a wheelchair when I'm 90. Uh, uh, do I want to lift weights? Uh, never, ever, ever. And, and I'm a former bodybuilder. Uh, but why do I do that? Because it brings value to my life. Now, that behavior repeated over and over again will... Uh, 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 carve ruts, uh, call it encoding, uh, will carve ruts in my brain like there are ruts in my driveway. Uh, in my driveway bad, in my brain good, uh, because those ruts uh, are a pattern of behavior that I don't really think about it. When it's time tomorrow morning, uh, you'll find me uh, lumbering into where I'm going to do my three miles on the elliptical, and it's just going to happen. That there is no not happening any more than there's no, I'm going to spontaneously start using my left hand instead of my right hand. That is encoded and carved and engraved in my brain also. Discipline is built on the back of motivation. Motivation is built on the back of thought processes. If it's going to be in a healthy direction, it has to be based on healthy thought processes. And there's your equation for the week of changing your life. Oh, Lynn. I love your passion and I love this topic. And, and I do believe there's a lot of people, there's a lot of us, I'm one of them that never really had an, any instruction on how to eat healthy or even how to do all of this. What are some real life stories that you have from clients that you've helped with your techniques? So I, I did have one client that came to me. Um, this is my this is my perfect client. And that's why I'm going to going to say that. She had some weight to lose, and she kept telling me, like many of my clients do, well, you know, I, I eat healthily. I, um, I, I'm really not bad in what I do, but after I'd seen her for a couple of times she, and she was comfortable with me, she told me that every night she and her husband had um, cocktails, quite a few of them, mm. and I said to her, well, you know, I, I I understand where you want to have one with with your dinner or after dinner, but maybe while you're trying to get into this healthy lifestyle, maybe cut it down because she had a problem. Her husband wanted her to drink with him, and so she was afraid to say, no, I'm not going to do it. But actually, over the months, she did get to the point where she would say to him, I'm really trying to not do this for a while, so please bear with me. And I taught her ways to to drink cocktails that had no alcohol. <laughs> um, she actually was a, a perfect client in that over a three-month period of time, she lost all the weight that she wanted to. She noticed such a dramatic change in her life um, that I, you know, and I've checked in with her 
because this was a couple of years ago, and she's doing fantastic. Um, now I have other clients that I have to start dealing with a whole different thing. I, I met with somebody that needed to lose weight and she got a lot of weight to lose, but she was going through so much drama, so much stress in her life, so much rejection, so much crap, excuse me, um, that we had to... Oh, that, that's know. okay. They've heard worse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to deal with her in a whole different way because she couldn't even begin to think about losing weight until she got to the point where she could see the good in herself. She could get rid of some of this stress. She could get her mind where it really needed to be. And so we had to work on getting her to the point of... Um, loving herself, caring about what was going on with her, managing the stress, getting into some relaxation and mindset changes before she could tackle that. So everybody is different and everybody has an Achilles heel when it comes to their own life. Um, I have one woman that she was very motivated uh, because she had had cancer, she got diabetes as a result of the cancer. Mm -hmm. And so um, she actually, over the last year, has lost like 82 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. She feels good and she's beginning to notice she's had good follow-ups with her CAT scans. Um, Health-wise, she's doing so much better, and she's feeling it. She's she's feeling she's very dedicated, like Dr. Heath's saying. You know, it's she might not feel like doing it, but her motivation is her health. So she's getting up and doing it however she feels she's going to do it. And that kind of person really has the drive they need to accomplish whatever they want. We all can accomplish whatever we want. As you say, when we're motivated to do it, and a lot of times uh, health is the motivation. So, you know, I've had clients that I've worked with, they've done really well, but they find it hard to keep up that healthy lifestyle because of their busy lifestyles. And while I can teach them how to live healthy during that busyness, it's always coming down to that choice and that motivation. But the majority of people I've worked with have beautifully lost weight and got into a healthy lifestyle and have not found it difficult. And, you know, I keep in touch with most of them on a consistent basis just to check in with them. And it's just amazing to see the difference with people. And it's not always about in the end, how much weight did I lose? Most of them will say it's how I feel. I feel so different. Yeah, I I, I wanted to to make a point that uh, uh, life is all about meaning making. And if if you're three hundred pounds, what does that mean about you as a person? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, your worth as a human being has nothing to do with your body weight. It's just a number. Uh, it, it amazes me. I, I've, I've, I've kind of even joked with my wife about this. You know, she, of course, won't tell me what her body weight is. And I'll say, well, what are you going to do? Go put it on a T-shirt? It, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, the worst things you can do when you're trying to get healthy is get on the scale every day. Yeah. Throw that darn thing out yeah. the, the window. There's only one use of a scale uh, when you're on a healthy, uh, in a healthy lifestyle. And that is actually to make sure you don't lose too much weight too quick. If you're losing more than three to five pounds a weight of week, quit it. Uh, three to five pounds a week. Uh, if there's more than that, it's too much. Because why? Well, because you're you're losing fat in areas that, uh, yeah. that aren't good for you. Because your body yeah. is ca catabolizing. That means consuming itself. Uh, uh, muscle tissue. Uh, guess what else is a muscle? Your heart is a muscle. It's consuming organ tissue. Uh, it about three pounds a week, two to maybe three pounds a week seems to be kind of the Goldilocks zone. But guys, we really need to develop a culture where we stop 
associating body weight with worth. One thing, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, if you're looking at me on camera, guys, uh, uh, many years ago, I think my top body weight was two, 298 and a half, uh, 298 and a half pounds. I was powerlifting back then, and it kind of comes in handy, weighing a lot. You can pick up heavy stuff. And uh, when I competed, I was, I think, 217. And now I am about 230. Uh, what do those numbers mean? Nothing. Uh, I'm not. I, I was. I was never a competitive wrestler. Uh, where body weight actually, you know, it matters. You get to put in a different weight class. In bodybuilding, there's a different weight class. But I was going to be heavyweight anyway, so it didn't matter. I'm six two. Uh, but one of the most valuable things you can do is to disconnect a freaking number on a scale with your worth. You can also disconnect the shape of your body with your worth. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, you were a worthy human being from your first breath, period. And if we can get back to that, the rest is much easier. Uh, uh, you want to lose weight, lose weight. You don't want to lose weight, don't lose weight. Just don't connect it to who you are or how important you are or how worthy you are as a person. That is a cognitive distortion. Uh, as as Lynn is saying, uh, if you, you want to lose weight, do it because you're healthier down the road. Uh, do it so you can have more fun fitting into more clothing or or doing things that you may not have done. And um, I noticed uh, just a couple minutes ago, Lynn, you talked about um, Achilles heels. And so I wanted to ask you, what are some of the biggest hurdles that you're still working on or still facing today? I have two big hurdles at the moment. Um, the genetics and I have have to watch my cholesterol and I have to watch my blood pressure. And oh, and now there's a new one. Thanks to my mother, I now have alopecia, which is um, loss of hair. And it's this kind is like men when they begin to bald. So I still believe that living a healthy lifestyle is going to change it. So being hereditary with my genetics, maybe my blood pressure is always going to be a little bit on the higher side. But with how I eat, I can control it um, with my alopecia. Although, yes, there are things that can be done to help. I'm told that once you have alopecia like that, it's not growing back unless there's something, some kind of follicle there. So I'm hoping and praying that I've got lots of follicles in my head to uh, to put that back. But I know that if you're eating sugar, that can cause hair loss. Um, so, you know, I'm doing my best to make sure that I eat a healthy meal at every meal so that it will help with that because whatever we're facing inflammation diabetes cholesterol whatever it is if you're living a healthy lifestyle you're already ahead of the game so as we age we've still got things that that we have to deal with and um the other thing that has been a real obstacle in my life, which is very unusual for people, is I run a high, a high potassium, which can affect the heart. Um, it can be very dangerous. And I've been at that danger point where I was sent to the ER. So I have to be careful when I eat not to eat potassium rich foods. It, I have it under control now. Um, but there are silly things that come up as we age. Maybe I call them silly things because I think potassium being high is silly. Um, <laughs> but there are ways through a healthy diet that you can address most things and help you because some of these things may not be going away. For example, my husband had stents in his heart. That's not going away, but living a healthy, active lifestyle is helping him to stay healthy. That's great. I had a quick question, too. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, being healthy and um but how do people get started? Like, how do you take that first step? What is what is it that you need to do first to get on that start of journey to eat healthy 
first of all, you know, you've got to, as Dr. Heath said, think about your motivation. What what do you want to change and what's going to motivate you to do it? I think that's why a health coach can be helpful to people because they've got accountability going there for you. And that's if you'll take that step and walk with somebody to get started, it becomes so much easier. But I think that you've got to acknowledge that um, I really need to do this and why do I need to do it? What's my motivation? And once you know what your motivation is, which 90% of the time is getting healthy, then you can get started. But that doesn't mean you just cut out all of your chocolates and processed food in one foul swoop because that's not going to keep you healthy. You're going to have some changes in your body that are not too healthy. So walk with somebody, get an accountability partner, help somebody to encourage you and, and motivate you at least while you're starting the journey. And, and, and I think giving giving these accountability partners permission uh, in my life, there's things, of course, I need to tackle. I'm working on being a better human every day and uh, still struggling with it every day, of course. But to actually say the words to somebody, uh, uh, I give you permission to keep me accountable to this and say it out loud, even sign a contract with them and hold yourself to that contract. Healthy human living is about making contracts with yourself and keeping those contracts. And Lynn, a couple more questions before we let you go. What what is the diet mentality that leads to disease? How would you put a fine edge on that? <laughs> Going after these quick fixes and promises that we are bombarded with, there is no quick fix for a healthy lifestyle and for losing weight. Um, if they're telling you that, well, most of those, because I've had experience with them, most of those quick fixes are going to involve things like eating 500 calories a day, totally unhealthy for you. So I think that that's one of the big disservices through advertisement that we have because buy these foods, you're going to lose weight. And you probably will, but uh, what happens when you've stopped eating those foods and you've lost the weight that you want to? Mm -hmm. So most of us with that diet mentality of following the quickest route possible, we want to lose the weight as quickly as possible. And I've tried just about everything out there, and I can honestly tell you that none of them work. Um, I'm a lifetime member of one of the very well-known ones, and I, I wouldn't go back because what they're teaching you is a habit of, oh, you can eat this cake and you're still going to lose weight. Well, yeah, you can if you're counting calories, but you don't want to run after those calories because you, you need to learn how to eat healthily. Well, sure, because there's no SpongeBob quick trick uh, that's going to get you there. The the best diet is no diet, but a lifestyle. Stop right. looking for a diet and find a lifestyle because the one that works is the one that you'll do and you'll keep on doing. For me, I've just found a, a lifestyle uh, that, that works for me. And no, uh, I'm not the uh, 3% body fat I was when I was competing, nor what I want to be, because that low of a body fat is not even healthy. Uh, for men, once you get to be, I don't know, 10 to 12%, less than that, just kind of gets to be unhealthy. These guys you see on TV that maintain that low level of body fat, that, that is unsustainable. And if you're one of them, come on the air, take your shirt off, we'll put you on camera, and then come back next week and the week after and the week after. I guarantee it's just not going to stay that way unless you're on drugs. Okay? That's the only way to do that that I know of. Uh, or you're starving yourself. And for women, I think it's somewhere around 16% uh, at, at the low end. And you get beyond that and just unhealthy things starts to happen. 
you have a type of body fat, which is a thermogenic body fat between your shoulder blades called brown fat. And gosh, I wish I could have more of that because that's what fuels your metabolism. Well, guys, we've learned so many things today. Uh, the substance that's in your cabinet that can hook you just like cocaine, if you had not figured it out, it is sugar. You got a cup of sugar, probably you got many cups in your coffee already today. Uh, we just talked about the diet mentality leads to disease is trying to find a quick fix. Are anti-aging and longevity possible? Absolutely. But you have to maintain the equipment even better than you maintain your automobile because your body is the vehicle that gets you through life. And this, of course, is how you can actually thrive beyond midlife. Hey, guys, I like to tell my wife I'm in my prime. Of course, she says, you look it, just like from the movie <laughs> Tombstone. Uh, but it doesn't keep me from maintaining a positive and a uh, healthy outlook. Uh, Lynn, uh, real quick, what would be your favorite secret sweet tooth hack? A quick tip for those that have a sweet tooth. See, ballers, time to quit your lollygagging. Get out of the dugout, onto the field, and live the art life. Find something that you love and make it health healthily. So if you like parfaits, then switch out that heavy, rich cream. Do something like coconut um, milk uh, or even get in a handful of almonds and crush them in a Nutribullet. It will become creamy and layer your parfait and there are plenty of ways that you can find something for that sweet tooth that's not going to be loaded in sugar mine is air pop popcorn air pop popcorn and i i put this um pizza uh, powder sprinkles on it that i got from well where everybody gets everything these days amazon and i don't have an affiliate <laughs> agreement i don't make money of that but but yeah to, to be creative try different things um, if you want more from Lynn, you can go to holistic-healthandwellness.com. That's holistic-healthandwellness.com. And if you want uh, information on uh, uh, coping through menopause, you can add a forward slash thrive hyphen through hyphen menopause hyphen. And I know that's long. I'll drop that in the show notes. Easy to scroll to the bottom and click on it. One last thing. We'll let Lynn go. We're going to go deep beneath the dark, deep precesses of therapy couch and ask Lynn our super secret Dr. I'm a Freud not question for the day. Uh, this was not rehearsed. We'd like to catch people off guard. We journey now with Doc Eath as he submerges with our special guest into the depths beneath the dark recesses of the therapy couch. Let, let me go down here again. And uh, here we have it right here. And I'm going to ask Lynn this super secret question. Okay, Lynn, you wake up in a nightmare buried, buried beneath your own most nightmarish food. What is it and why? <laughs> My most nightmarish food. Hmm. <laughs> I think I would have to think about marshmallows. If I marshmallows. marshmallows. Oh, I love marshmallows. I love marshmallows. You know, they now have a marshmallow that is flat uh, for better making s'mores. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, all things in moderation, guys. I'll have mine only on Saturday. There's that 20%. <laughs> That's the 20%. My 20% comes in on Saturdays. Lynn, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a blast, such healthy, nutritious thinking, and uh, we wish you best in all your work. Thank you, T-Ballers, for joining. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye now. Bye, Bye. Welcome to On the Couch and Off Our Rocker with Dr. Ima Freudnot where we review our special guest's Therapy Bites Art Lab episode, Psychomolarchy Scale Assessment Results. That's PMS for short. Lynn Wadworth's PMS performance places her in the 97th percentile on the PMS's Quadruple S Sugar Smashing Superhero Scale. This indicates a scrumptiously superlative degree of sugar-busting knowledge in Lynn's cortical crevices with a candy-crushing, sugar-slaying tendency towards annihilating sugar addiction. 
overall, Lean Wadworth's PMS Psychosymmetric Assessment results present a picture of an individual lusciously and alluringly apt to combat sugar addiction, who tames saccharine syrupy impulses by helping others transform their lives one bite at a time, without getting all judgy like a sugar-shunning Sherlock Holmes. This health-obsessed wellness-devoted soul likely has a prognosis of positive propensity towards thriving in the near future until the gloriously glucose-stabilizing features of her psyche have been psychomologically analyzed and exercised. It is my considered conclusion that sugar-busting Lynn Wadsworth be prescribed no less than a 517 milligram ST subtemptational dose of sugar banatol and a 2300 milligram IM intramotivational dose of sweet tooth oxytin to curtail cavity causing glucose guzzling cognitions. Dr. Ima Freudnacht, Chief Shrinkstigator, Therapy Bites Art Lab. Grab some of this episode's guest merchandise, specially designed to help keep this episode's message top of mind in your life. Don't forget friends and family members who could use an Art Lab mental boost, too. Just go to therapybites.myshopify.com. Hey, T-Ballers. Thanks so much for being with us today. If we brought value to your day, show us some love by leaving your positive feedback and inviting some friends to listen in and join the T-Ball team. Next time on Therapy Bites Art Lab. Hey, T-Ballers, lean in and listen up to the problem we can help you solve today. How can you help another person see more clearly when they're all in the middle of catastrophizing and everything? How can you get them to listen to reason? You know that we teach in the art lab that no one can control your neurons, but does that mean that we have no influence? Today, we'll learn some crisis-tested world-class techniques from one of the world's best negotiators. Uh, this battle-tested uh, negotiator trains negotiators all over the world, and we have him here just for you. Uh, if you've seen Samuel L. Jackson in the movie The Negotiator, he's the real guy that Kevin Spacey is pretending to be. Sir. Government legal gobbledygook. Therapy Bites is not intended as a diagnostic or as an alternative to professional clinical treatment. Resources and advice are for information and entertainment purposes only. Brought to you by... Someone saying things you don't like? Tape that nagging loudmouth shut. Government-approved speech tape. Gas tape. Now available at your local hardware store. Therapy Bites Art Lab is not, not, not an approved, not, endorsed, not, not. authorized, blood kissing affiliate of the United States Special Offense Assessment Police. Soap for short. Warning. Consumption of Therapy Bites Art Lab content by Kool Aid drinking, stinking, thinking, social media, pseudo psychological pushing, wacky woke anti free speech mumbo jumbo advocates may cause spontaneous internal skull combustion, stomach discomfort, and or laxative effects. Allergy warning. Therapy Bites is manufactured in a facility that challenges nutty distortions, processes nuggets of accurate, realistic thinking, and life-affirming reliefs. This is the audio version of the legal fine print. Why are you still listening to this when you can catch the next great episode of Therapy Bites Art Lab with a good friend or family member? Really? Are you still there? <laughs> this is getting silly. Move on to the next psychologically thrilling episode of the best advice on the net. No copay required. Me eat copay. Yeah, with Dr. Heath and the T-Ball team. Go ahead. Don't be podgorophobic. Scoot, scoot, scoot. On to the next episode. <laughs>